Thank you all for coming, uh, especially for what I think was not the most obvious of Friday, first Friday films. Um, you know, when we show something like Forget Paris, it's perfectly clear what the movie is going to be about, and everyone's seen it already, and they're just uh, in for another viewing over a glass of wine and all of that. The sound of the car tree, I suspect, means nothing whatsoever to most people who are just here because you like the idea of our first Friday films and maybe saw the Pyrenees exhibition and want to learn more. Um, in a way, these programs, rather than those with the obvious films that people already know, are more special to those of us who work here because we feel like we're bringing you something new that you otherwise might not even have heard of, much less have seen. The a film tonight is called The Sound of the Car Tree, and in it, Yo-Yo Ma will be playing the Bach cello suites in an imaginary prison, a virtual prison, that is based on the imaginary prisons, the so-called Car Tree di Invenzione, by Gian Battista Piranese. And all of the prints of the imaginary prisons, and in fact, the video recreation of them, are in the exhibition. But with the exhibition only having been open for seven days, I'm not going to presume that all of you have seen it. And so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about Piranese before turning to the prisons. And you see him here. Piranese was born in 1720. He died in 1778. So you see an image of him at left, an engraving um, made to his specifications by the engraver Polizzani, um, in which you see the 30-year-old Piranese bare-chested and with a broken arm like some bit of classical sculpture, like a ruin or a relic himself. And then two images, one by Pietro Labruzzi, a portrait painter in Rome, and another by his son, Frances Francesco Piranese, made the year after Piranese died as sort of memorials from, from, for him. Piranesi was a true 18th century polymath. He was an architect, an etcher, an antiquarian, a vedutista, that is, someone who made views, view paintings of Rome, a designer, um, so says the subtitle of the book that accompanies the exhibition. He was also, we could add, an interior decorator, maybe the first person whom we could actually call an interior decorator in the history of art. He was an art dealer, he was a theorist, he was a critic, he was a polemicist who was not beyond a kind of self-aggrandizement, um, a sense of which you get from the print it left on the screen. His career happens entirely in Rome, but he was a Venetian by training and throughout his entire life continued to refer to himself as a Venetian architect. Um, he was from a family that were more architect, more engineers than architects in Venice. Uh, some of his uncles worked as part of the waterworks division in Venice, overseeing the canals, overseeing the flow of water through the city. And he received his first training there, a very practical education in architecture. And he wanted throughout his life to be an architect, to be someone who built buildings and planned cities, especially the city of cities, Rome, but who was essentially an architect monke. He was a failed architect who only made a single building in his entire career. It's a pretty great building, the Church of Santa Maria del Priorato on the Aventine Hill in Rome, the mother church of the, uh, the, the Knights of Malta. Um, a church very much in that 18th century spirit of applied architecture, where the church itself is basically a big rectangle, a big box, but the decoration of it is truly extraordinary, from the stucco on the facade to these details inside, where you just have a range of decoration and a range of motifs that are unlike any other church being built at the time. It's a kind of wild fantasy of architecture it was not entirely practical, and this may, as much as anything, have to do with his limited commissions as an architect. But having realized relatively early in his career that he was not going to win commissions, Piranese very cleverly remade himself. And he became a scholar, a printmaker, an archaeologist, um, someone who understood the ancient city as, and, and made engravings of it, as a way of promoting himself as the ideal person to make the new Rome. He constantly dedicated his prints to important patrons or potential patrons, especially to Clement XIII, the Venetian Pope of the Rizzonico family. 
And the idea here is that Pyrenees, you know, in publishing this map of Rome, is explaining that he understood the fabric of the ancient city. He understood the glories that Rome had been in the first, second, third century AD. He understood exactly what it was in the 18th century, and he understood what the city could still be. It's not just a kind of bland dedication to the Pope. It's a desire to get work, a desire to win commissions, a desire to encourage the Pope to make architecture of a level of grandeur like that which the ancient Romans had made. It's an encouragement to the Pope to be like the Caesars of old. And there's a not very subtle subtext in this that Piranese could be like the builders of old. He could make things that would stand the test of time and that would be grand monuments like those uh, which still stood all around the city from the ancient world. It never really pans out. He never becomes that builder, but nonetheless, he does show throughout his life this love of learning. I think I've forgotten to turn the microphone on. Sorry, Greg. Um, this love of learning, this love of scholarship, this love of Rome that becomes infective and, in fact, informs not just the pope and the potential patrons, but visitors to Rome, the grand tourists, because this is the great age of the grand tour in which 18th century Englishmen, in lieu of going to the universities, which are deemed far too liberal and not trustworthy, were sent by their fathers, along with a tutor, through Europe to spend time in France, where they would learn things like dancing and swordsmanship, and then ultimately to Italy, where they would study the ancient monuments, learn about the ancient city, learn about Republican government, learn about the possibilities of what government could accomplish. It was all kind of training to make future parliamentarians well, actually, it's all in training to make future members of the House of Lords. These people, though, are all fall under the spell of Piranese, not because of his buildings, but because of his prince, because he's the person who can explain the city to them. He's the person who actually does what they are there to do. They're there to learn. They're there to look at the ancient monuments and see what the modern city can become. And Piranese is the one teaching people how to think about all of this. Along the way, he is engaged in not a few um, academic debates, although academic debates in 18th century Rome tended not to be limited strictly to the university the way that they are today. So it was the sort of thing that every grand tourist and every member of cultured society talked about in the late 18th century, the debate of whether ancient Greek architecture in its simplicity and purity of form or ancient Roman architecture in its multiplication of ornament and its richness and its much more clever engineering was the superior product. Piranese always comes down on the side of the Romans. So we have uh, here at left the title page of his book on the magnificence of the Romans and the magnificence and architecture of the Romans. His opponents were the architects at the French Academy and especially, especially the German, Winkelmann, supported by Anton Raphael Mengs, by whom we bought that painting a couple of years ago, which some of you will know, who said, no, 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 Greek architecture, then relatively recently discovered, was the pure architecture. That was where all the rules were made. And here's a typical Piranesi response to that. So the subtext here, or the text, more or less says, there are those, my opponents think, that the Ionic capitals, the, the Erechtheion in Athens, are the pinnacle of the Ionic capital and that nothing could succeed this. But in contrast, Piranese asks his audience, let's look at some of the Ionic capitals in Rome. And there are hundreds of different varieties. And here's one set of them. And you would flip the, to the next page. And there are another 15 examples. And he sort of asks the rhetorical question, well, this is nice, but wouldn't you really rather have the choice? Wouldn't you really rather have an architecture that's not bound by rules, that encourages fantasy, encourages a kind of organic development? And it's never just about the capitals. It's never just about that. It's about architecture broadly, culture more broadly, ornament more broadly, taste more broadly. Piranesi is more than anything, more than a scholar, more than an archaeologist, more than an antiquarian, a tastemaker in 18th century Rome. And ultimately, he wins the battle. Even if the debate is never resolved in Rome, it's Piranesi's prince engaged in this debate that become the storehouse of motifs for 200 years of architecture 
in a classical mode. You, know, you go to country house after country house in England, and you find examples in houses by people like Robert Adams or William Chambers of Pyrenaean motifs. And that continues through the 19th century. And you go to France, and the uh, Empire style, which is, again, another variety of neoclassicism, but one that embraces the richness of Pyrenees' demonstrations of ornament in these didactic tracks. And it's sort of ironic that although he fails to win architectural commissions, it's not ironic, it's actually you know, a, a kind of vindication of Pyrenees, although he fails to win most of the architectural commissions in Rome of his time, He's the person who remains famous forever. We don't know who built, I mean, we do know, but none of you could name, and even most art historians couldn't name, who built the Trevi Fountain, or who built the Ripetta, the port in Rome, or who built any of the, the Spanish steps, to tame, name three of the great projects done in Rome during Piranesi's lifetime. But we all know Piranesi. His is the taste that survives for 200 years. And in addition to all the prints, he's actually a designer and art dealer who would go out to the excavations in the countryside. And at the moment, the excavations at Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli were the big thing. And he didn't try to buy up or capture the figurative monuments. He didn't try to get the copies of Venus or the busts of Roman emperors. What he did was buy the decorative fragments, heads, bits of tripods, griffins, things like that. And he would take these and incorporate the few fragments of antiquity into new monuments, which were essentially carved in the 18th century, and sell these to the grand tourists. And the more savvy of these tourists would realize, oh, this or that part of my giant vase, and those of you who have seen the show realize that this is a vase that it stands about eight feet tall. Some people would realize that this or that part of my vase might actually be ancient, but the rest is modern. But in a way, it didn't matter. It represented carving al antica, and it represented the taste that one had acquired on the Grand Tour. And Piranese is very savvy, too, about encouraging his patrons, because if you were a good client of the man, he would dedicate a print to you. So dedicate to his excellence, my lord, Fort Rose who is most expert in all the fine arts. Now, every grand tourist bought the volumes of prints. Whether they bought vases or real or fake antiquities or not, they still bought all of Piranesi's prints. So my lord Fort Rose goes back to England in the portfolio of every grand tourist through the agency of Piranesi. And this, of course, means that when the next decade of tourists come, they want to go to Piranesi and be his client so that he will memorialize them in an engraving which will last through the ages. It's an incredibly clever strategy that he develops. But then, amid all of this, amid the architecture and the archaeology and the decorative objects and his dealings as a grand tourist, he makes, for the first time, in sometime in the late 1740s, 1745, 49, somewhere in there, while still a man in his 20s, a set of engravings and etchings, they're kind of mixed media engraving and etching, called the Invenzioni Capricciose di Cartri, the Capricious Inventions of Prisons. And these are not like anything else that he did. These are not based on any surviving ancient fragment or any surviving ancient building or any archaeological evidence. They are caprice, capricci, they are pure fantasy totally out of his mind. And this first edition, done in the late 1740s, seems almost to have been ahead of its time. There are very few sets of the first edition that survive today, which suggests that there were not very many printed because there were not very many bought. No one really pays that much attention to these prints at their first, in their first edition. No one takes much notice. They don't become a great commercial success. Nonetheless, they are, by any estimation, revolutionary works. They do relate to some things that Piranesi had done. They come, for example, out of his prints of Capriccio Grotesque. Here's an example that's actually slightly later than the car tree, but it shows kind of what I'm talking about. The Grotesque, this kind of set of ruins, this jumble of ruins and vegetation and bits of classical architecture and classical sculpture, with a few nudes 
and a few kind of mysterious characters thrown in. This is this fantasy world of the Venetian Rococo. This is Piranese combining his visits to the Roman ruins with his knowledge of what's been going on in Venice in the work of someone like Tiepolo, whom you could call, if you want, to the tail end of the Baroque. And Tiepolo Scherzi, his own capricci, his own caprices, had been published only a few years before, less than a decade earlier than the prisons. And they have their world of magi, of magicians, of witches, of skeletons, of oriental philosophers, quote unquote, whatever that means, of skeletons, of grandeur and decay all mixed. It's this world of, of Tiepolo Scherzi from which comes our great head of a philosopher, what we used to call head of an oriental philosopher, but oriental has become a sort of bad word, um, that hangs upstairs in our gallery. It's this pure fantasy, this caprice, this idea of a world that is barely touchable in looking at the remains of antiquity, but that is a fantasy world of its own right. And that this fantasy world is one that artists can create, but to which we as viewers in the 18th century could respond. This idea of the fantasy and the caprice was not just limited to the world of the witches and philosophers. It's very much the same spirit that you see in Venetian paintings of the time. For example, uh, again, taking your work upstairs in the galleries, the architectural caprice by Bellotto, made in Dresden, but Bellotto, of course, is Venetian, in which he joins part of the Zwinger to the library um, Marciana from Venice in a building that never existed, in a place that never existed, making an interesting picture, but one that picks up on references which Bellotto's viewers then as now would recognize and realizing the power of the arts to create worlds, create a kind of fantasy world which appeals to people who know the references. Um, even someone like Guardi painting the Rialto, that great painting, maybe the best of our Venetian paintings in the collection, yeah, the Rialto's a real place, but in that wild scrum of people passing back and forth in the canal, more or less entirely invisible in this slide, you get this sense of invention and richness and abundance that underlies the world of these paintings, of Tiepolo Scherzi, and ultimately of the prisons as well. And to get a sense of the fantasy element and the abundance, you need only compare the print at left which is from Piranesi's Prima Parte di Architettura, his first volume of architectural drawings, which ultimately look more like stage sets, backdrops, which in fact they are. They're inspired by designs by other artists, the Bibiena, which are essentially backdrops. They're not real studies of real spaces. But look at that so-called design for a dark prison from the Prima Parte in the early 1740s, and then one of the cartridge done just a few years later, and there's a total difference of spirit in these. This is a kind of study of architectural motifs. The prison is a whole world that we as viewers are invited to wander in and lose ourselves in. Even the technique of the etching, there's something careful, calculated, very neat about the Prima Parte prison. But there's a kind of inherent printmaker's messiness to the cartridge. They are works of art that demand attention as works of art. They're not trying to document, they're trying to engage and absorb the viewer. And to do this with a series of fantastic architectural spaces, fanta fantastic prisons, is something that had quite literally never happened before in the history of art. These are pure invention. They go beyond the world of Tiepolo Scherzi and do something that had never happened before. It could be said, perhaps, that these are what an architect gets to when he envisions the fantasy world. His is not a fantasy world of people, it's a fantasy world of spaces, columns, blocks, devices, pulleys, and ropes. But as I say, in 1745, 1749, no one really seems to have taken notice. There's very little contemporary description of the first edition and very few survive, which suggests that not many were bought. The more that are bought, the more that are printed. Piranes has his own printing press in his palace. But then, 12 or 15 years later, around 1761, a second edition is printed. And this second edition is a huge success and remains even today perhaps the most famous part of Piranesi's output. The prints are made, the plates are printed again and again, 
and again. Everyone who goes to Rome has to have a set, and they have a long lasting and powerful impact on the subsequent history of art. And the prints are deeply reworked. Piranesi has kind of progressed in these 15 years. So if you compare, for example, the title page of the first and second edition, the first edition at left, the second edition at right, they've ceased to be capricious inventions of Cartri, and now they've become Cartri di Invenzione, Cartri di Invenzione, imaginary prisons. Not caprices, not something light, thrown off the cuff, fantastic, but imaginary prisons. There's something more forceful in the title that goes along with the prints. Now, you have to understand, these are, in fact, printed from the same copper plate. It's not that he makes a new title page. He takes this copper plate, burnishes, re-etches, re you know, immerses it in acid several times more, makes an entirely new plate out of the print. It's a what could be called, what is always inevitably called in etching, a Rembrandtian gesture. You think of Rembrandt and the many reworked states of his best, most famous, most ambitious prints. And there's something very simpler, sim similar going on here. In fact, in Thomas de Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater of 1821, in which de Quincey and Samuel Coleridge, who's a kind of stand-in, written-in character, Samuel Coleridge the poet, they discuss Piranesi's prisons, and they talk about them as the products of, a, of Piranesi, basically on drugs. Um, in that discussion, which goes on and on for a couple of paragraphs, one of the two characters, I can't remember whether it's De Quincey or Coleridge, says, yes, you know, Piranesi was, after all, the Rembrandt of etching, which is a bit of an oxymoron, because Rembrandt was an etcher himself. Rembrandt is the Rembrandt of etchings. And it's been you know, suggested in scholarship ever since that you know, maybe De Quincey was, in fact, still slightly opiate influenced when he wrote this. And what he really meant to say was that Piranesi was the Rembrandt of architecture. That's a statement that would make sense. That in the reworking of prints and you know, thinking about the changes, yeah, you still have this pier, but the bridge is going across. The increased depth and the increased spatial sophistication of the prints you also see um, uh, more elusive references, more direct references, to devices of torture. So instead of just the rings here, you've now got this great spiked wheel on which you are to imagine prisoners being stretched or killed. Um, there's something darker about the tone of these prints in the second edition. Comparing another first and second edition, another one of the cover plates, there's something quite literally, literally darker. The prints are worked much more. The spaces are shadowier. There's just more elaboration of everything. Um, they, be, they, they get a slightly different tone, a much more powerful tone, ultimately, in the second edition. And it could be said that if in the first state they are capricious architecture, little sketches, little fantasies of architecture, in the second state, in the 1761 edition, they really have become not prints about architecture, but worlds that we as viewers are meant to inhabit. We're not meant to look at them like a stage set any longer. We're meant to imagine ourselves immersed in that world, to go back through all of those dark architectural spaces, to imagine ourselves trapped in these mazes of space, trapped in this horrible, overbearing, almost megalomaniacal architecture that Piranesi has created. But this does beg a certain question. And it's a question that actually was asked in the question time of our symposium last weekend. And the question is, how do these connect to the rest of Piranesi? Even if we've seen how these come out of the fantasy, what really do these have to do with the person who's making archaeological prints, or the polemics about Rome and Greece, the uh, attempts to win patronage, the studies of the ancient and modern city, how does this help one win patronage? If anything, this sort of thing makes people think of you that you have, as one contemporary critic said, quella pazza libertà di lavorare a capriccio, that mad liberty to work only by caprice. This doesn't bode well if you're trying to be an architect. This suggests you're going to make some fantastic drawings, buildings that could never exist. This doesn't do anything for patrons. 
they're completely outside most of Piranesi's work. And this was recognized even at the time. And as I say, even you know, just a, a random question from the audience right here last weekend, you know, how do these connect? And there are you know, different ways of answering this question, but uh, you know, ultimately, it, it, every person has a slightly different answer. Um, interestingly, critics, on Pir critics, scholars, writers on Piranesi have tended to focus either exclusively on the cartery or on everything else and to ignore these altogether. The architectural critics and the archaeologists barely mention these. And in fact, John Pinto, uh, one of our speakers at the symposium, when asked about these, when, when this question came up, said, yeah, well, I teach Piranesi all the time, but I have to admit I almost never do the cartery in my classes. They're something else. They're a kind of distraction from the matter at hand perhaps. And I don't think they are. I think they're very much part of who Piranesi was, and I think they're very much part of his time. And if the 1740s edition, the 1745 or 49 edition, whatever the year is, we don't know for sure, didn't sell, I think in that intervening decade, a number of things happened that made audiences understand what Piranesi was going on about. I think his audience caught up to him in that intervening 12 or 15 years. And without giving ourselves over to a kind of zeitgeist historicism, I think we can show that the prisons are very much a product and embodiment of their time. Because if the 18th century is the age of the Enlightenment, if it's the age in which the first encyclopedias are written, if it's the age of great scientific discovery and a kind of modern archaeological method and a kind of cleanness of learning. It's also the time of a kind of counter-enlightenment, to use a term that's uh, invented by the Neapolitan philosopher Vico just at that moment. The 18th century might be the enlightenment, but it's also the time of the Gothic novel, for example. So what you're seeing here is a whole run of images about Horace Walpole, who, yes, looks a bit like a, an English schoolboy, which he never ceased being in a way, but who builds not a modern country house in neoclassical style such as was expected, but in this Gothic fantasy. This is not a medieval house. This is a late 18th century house built in a medieval style in some kind of fantasy of architecture. But more importantly for our question, Walpole also writes the first Gothic, what, the first example of what we would today call the Gothic novel, the Castle of Otranto which is called in the first edition a story, but by the second edition has become a gothic story. This book that, was, you know, that he pretended was translated by William Marshall, who's nobody. I mean, it's written by Horace Walpole. It's a pseudonym. From the original Italian of Onofrio Moralto, who again is a nobody, is, it doesn't exist. This fantasy of this tale set in a medieval castle with strange apparitions and giant feet coming into the picture. This kind of almost primitive, first example of like a horror movie in novel form comes out exactly at the time of Piranesi. Um, here is an illustration done of a scene in the novel by Henry Fusley, who's best known, of course, for images like The Nightmare. And I think we can draw a direct line from the world of the prisons to the world of Fusley's Nightmare, that well-known painting. And you think about Walpole and whether this is sort of just kind of in the air, but Walpole had gone on the Grand Tour, insisted on meeting Piranesi, and then in his anecdotes of painting, in Walpole's anecdotes of paintings, says things specifically about Piranesi. For example, he talks about Piranesi as savage as Salvatore Rosa, fierce as Michelangelo and as exuberant as Rubens. Piranesi has imagined scenes that would startle geometry, the prisons that seem to make no sense, and exhaust the Indies to realize the wealth of the Indies couldn't build buildings as grand as those in the prisons, being the gist of this. Piranesi piles palaces on bridges and temples on palaces and scales heaven with mountains of erudition. Yet, what taste in his boldness, what grandeur in his wildness, what labor and thought both in his rashness and details. Walpole, of course, is also very much influenced by the philosophy of the sublime, first codified in a way just at this moment by Edmund Burke in his book, again, The Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin Ideas of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful, um, 
here's the original title page. Here's the modern Penguin Classics edition, which of course has one of Piranesi's prisons as the cover illustration. This idea of a philosophy of the sublime, the mixing of beauty and terror, that the terrifying could be stimulating, the terrifying could lead to a kind of aesthetic experience, is something new and endemic, really, to the 18th century. It's wonder mixed with fear. You could say, in a way, that the prisons that Piranesi devises are Mistophelian, even a decade or two before Goethe invents his Mistopheles. It's all of a piece. This is all this mind of the 18th century and this beauty mixed with terror and this wonder mixed with awe. Um, uh, you know, to take a few examples going forward, I show one of Joseph Wright of Darby's views of the eruption of Vesuvius, another great stop on the Grand Tour. You'd go to Naples and you'd stand in awe as Vesuvius was erupting conveniently in that moment it was. So here's, again, a, a painting more or less exactly contemporary with the prisons by someone who would have met Piranese. And then skipping forward a couple of decades, but it's such a well-known image, Caspar David Friedrich's Wander Above the Mist, Again, a kind of embodiment of this philosophy of the sublime, that in that moment of terror and, and the unknown, you find moments of beauty. That is something that we do get very much in Piranesi's Carchery. And it's not so different, in a way, from other things that he'd done. Even if the Carchery seem, at first glance, to stand out, you look at something like his imaginary Via Appia from the 1750s and there's a kind of fecund imagination. So here's what the real Via Appia looks like. We know that the Via Appia was lined with the tombs of the Romans. Piranese invents tombs, where he takes what tombs exist and completes them, adds to them. He brings grave stella, he brings funeral altars from all over Rome and invents more and creates this stage set, this thing that is an attempt to inspire what could be called the sublime experience. It's so rich, it's so over the top, it's so abundant that we are left with something approaching awe, and that becomes the aesthetic experience. So too his studies of the aqueduct coming out of Lake Albano, where the great reservoir now in ruins with trees coming out of it is a place that grand tourists would go and visit. Or what might be the best demonstration, this print, all of these prints, I should point out, are in the exhibition. Um, the foundations of the tomb of Hadrian, today known as the Castel Sant'Angelo. So here's the drum of Castel Sant'Angelo up there. And these are these foundations that Piranese has made this etching of. To give you a sense of the scale, these are little people down here. But these don't exist, or if they do, we don't know, because the extent of excavation below the drum has never gone below this first cornice here. This is pure fantasy on the part of Piranese. But in that fantasy of this amazing wall, the wonders of Roman architecture, the wonders not of Roman architecture, of architecture generally, and our small human scale in relation to it, we see how his fascination with architecture is very much of a piece with the world of the prisons that he has created. It could also be said that the prisons are very much part of a bigger picture of 18th century architecture, uh, what is called at times the architecture of the imagination, architecture on a truly megalomaniacal scale, of which the best example is Boulay's Cenotaph for Sizig Newton. To give you a sense of the scale of this proposed building, these are a line of trees. This is hey, the tomb of Hadrian a hundred times grander because of course there was a line of trees up here originally as well. This is something far beyond that, far beyond anything that ever, anyone had ever built. A building larger than any building anyone had ever even conceived at that moment. Another kind of architectural fantasy of the time that is in fact a bit later than Piranesi's prisons but of the same spirit of them is Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, his idea for prison reform of a sort. Um, which has ultimately, much later, been realized in real prisons built in the 19th and early 20th centuries, such as this one in Cuba, in which all the prisoners would be in these open-faced cells with someone able to observe them from a tower in the middle. This is kind of an architecture of oppression such as had never existed before. If you think about earlier prisons, if you go to Rome, you go to the Mamertine prison where St. Peter was imprisoned, 
it's a kind of cramped little room. It's a, like a cramped basement. This idea of uh, an architecture on a grand scale, even as a prison, is something new to the 18th century mind. And even if guided by Enlightenment ideas that this was a better way of building a prison, it's still slightly horrifying when you stop to think about the implications of such a building. And it's not just the fantastic architecture. Real buildings done at the time might have inspired Piranesi to think the same way. You think of Van Vitelli's Palace of Caserta in Naples on a scale that makes Versailles seem miniaturized. Or even more uh, directly related to this, Fernando Fuga's so-called Albergo dei Poveri in Naples. And it's hard to get a sense of this building in slides, but it is a thousand feet long. It is over 10 football fields long. You get a sense in the aerial view. It just goes on and on and on and on. It was a building created to hold eight or 10,000 inhabitants who included the poor, orphans, the infirm, the insane, the elderly, and prisoners as well. This being built precisely at the same moment that Piranese is designing the prison etchings. Um, and it was a kind of prison slash workhouse slash orphanage. And it wasn't that anyone was in cells in this building, but all these people were kind of shut into this building and it becomes a world of its own. 8,000 people living in a single building that just existed at that time outside the walls of the city of Naples. It's an alternate universe for the unwanted, the poor, the orphans, the insane, the prisoners. Piranesi had to have known about things like this, it seems to me. Even, he certainly knew the ones in, in, he certainly knew what was happening in Naples, traveling on a regular basis back and forth to see the excavations of Pompeii and Herculaneum. Even in Rome, we have a very similar structure being built, again, just at the same moment, the so-called comp monumental complex of San Michele, there along the Tiber River, river in the south part of Rome, which again was a kind of workhouse, orphanage, prison, uh, home for prostitutes or reformed prostitutes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the outcasts of society shut into one building, not in cells, but just kind of trapped in this alternate universe. I think to get a sense of what life might have been like in these complexes, these monumental, megalomaniacal buildings, we can look at something like the contemporary print by Hogarth of the Rake's Progress of the interior of Bedlam Prison. This is where the adjective, adjective bedlam, or the noun, the adjective, you know, it's like bedlam. This is where it comes from. Bedlam prison, which again was a kind of prison, debtor's prison, insane asylum, all mixed together, no cells. Everyone's just shut into this world, and you get a sense of everyone from the rake to the kind of insane and diseased, all kind of in this alternate universe. Given that these things are happening at just the same time, it doesn't seem that much of a jump to imagine that Pyrenees is creating these prisons as a kind of warning of the possibly excessive power of architecture. Architecture could go mad. Architecture could pass from the reasonable and the, the magnificent into something slightly horrifying. It's the flip side. It's that caprice. It's a very sophisticated idea for the time, but I think it's ultimately part of the story of the car tree. And it's that uneasiness in the prints that I think makes, us retain, makes them retain some of the fascination that they have continued to have for the 200 years or more since they were done. Now what's interesting is that the people in these prisons are not chained and struggling. The only heroic forms we see are in the title page and in the tenth plate where we see these Michelangelesque slaves but these actually seem more like bits of sculpture stuck in to represent slavery. Because all the people are these little crabbed, huddled masses in the margins of the print. No one is heroic or striving or chained in the actual images. Um, it's all elusive. It's all suggestive in the way. And this has been noted many times before. One of the best of all discussions of the prisons is not by an art historian but by the writer Aldous Huxley, who had his own in interests in alternate societies and, and, and outcasts. And Huxley writes, for example, in the prisons, there are no heroic muscles, no extroverted exhibitionism, 
not a trace of social life. Every man is clothed, muffled up, furtive, and even when in company, completely alone. Piranesi's prisons are the inhabitants of hell, which, though but one of innumerable worst of all possible worlds, is completely credible and bears the stamp of an unquestionable authenticity. And although these are not actual prisons, they do recognize the real world of the prisons. But no lecture on the prisons would be complete without turning from the discussion of them as a product of their time to the issue of the prisons as a, an inspiration, as, a, as, as, as something copied by later times, both ideally and, in fact, in real prisons. Because one of the men, one of the English architects who goes to Rome at the time these are being done, and meets Piranese, and we know had direct contact on a number of occasions with Piranese, is the architect George Dance, who shortly after returning home from Rome is commissioned to build Newgate Prison in London, which doesn't stand any longer, hence the kind of old photos and etchings. And you get a sense here of, in this view of the men in the yard, surrounded by these high walls, where the long blank facade, the kind of forbidding architecture, you get a sense that dance has actually taken Piranesi to heart and has kind of created a world like that in the prisons, unlike any prison that had been built before. As one person has pointed out, as one architectural critic has pointed out, dance was unlimited by the tiresome necessity of finding a place for windows in this building and has instead creating an art, created an architecture that is functional as a prison, but is even more importantly symbolic. It's terrifying. It's sublime that Londoners passing this building with its powerful facade, it, the building itself serves as a warning against crime, lest you be imprisoned in this structure. Architecture and its meaning becomes part of the message of Piranesi's prisons. But it has less literal and longer implications. Um, it's often been said that the prisons are the greatest set of fantasies before Goya's Capriccios done at the end of the century. And I think comparing some of the characters like those in the print known as the Great Wheel to some of the demons, witches, dreamers, gaunt, whatever they are, gaunt madmen um, in, the, the, in the Capriccios, we see a kind of connection, a continuation of the Piranesi mind frame. And even going much, much further, when Alfred Barr did his first surrealism exhibition in the then newly founded Museum of Modern Art in New York, he began the show with a set of Piranesi's prisons and drew a line between them and the works of someone like de Chirico and these metaphysical landscapes, the symbolic power of, of architecture on a grand scale, or the so-called Mertzbau, this you know, kind of walk-in collage by Schwitters, which didn't really, which actually was destroyed. This is an old photograph from before the war. But again, this is this kind of space built on fantasy that takes over our imagination. It's only a small step, of course, from surrealism and the prisons to the works of M.C. Escher, who, uh, um, in fact, lived in Rome for a great many years and was directly inspired by these prisons, as was for example, Fritz Lang in his Metropolis. Again, the idea of the city gone wild, the city going beyond normal human reason, where his point of reference for that, as has been long recognized, as Lang himself um, acknowledged, was the prison etchings by Piranesi. Or to take this truly up to the modern day, one can talk about the moving stairways. I'm sorry I don't have a better slide, but the moving stairways of Harry Potter's Hogwarts have everything to do with these etchings. I mean, and in the movie, they make the point as explicitly as could possibly be imagined. The list of later echoes goes on and on and on. My point tonight is, is not to trace every influence of the prisons, because you could also look at the prisons' impact on virtually every architect of the late 19th and early 20th century. But instead, to try to explain their genesis, perhaps to hint at their unending fascination, and to explain why it would be of interest to Yo-Yo Ma to be captured to record the Bach cello suites in a sound stage that attempts to replicate the space of the prisons. That there's this idea that there is something in the air in the late 18th century that is of a piece and that these 
spaces, although imaginary, embody that spirit. And they are the ideal situation in which to understand that music like so much else that happened at the time, inspired directly or indirectly by Piranesi. And finally, it's this attempt to remind 20, 21st century viewers in an age of large screen TVs, 3D movies and the like, how extraordinary the prisons are. And it's in an attempt to remind contemporary viewers of their power that Factum Arte, one of the agencies responsible for creating the exhibition we have here, made this three-dimensional digital recreation of the prisons in which you are flown through the spaces. They take the prints and blow them up into a series of realistic spaces, well, semi-realistic spaces, but to help you understand just how extraordinary, how enormous the spaces are, they've brought them to life in a way. And that video is one of the, cent is maybe the centerpiece of the whole exhibition, this idea of Piranesi is someone who is not frozen in the 18th century, but who continues to fascinate and inspire us even today. And just as Piranesi looked at ancient Rome not as a dead historical past, but as an inspiration for contemporary culture, just as Piranesi thought a vase made with a bit of antiquity and a lot of modern carving was a perfectly viable, valid object, so too this digital three-dimensional performance of the etchings could be said in the in exhibition, could be said to treat Piranesi in the way that he treated antiquity. It's constantly living, eternally imagined prison and inspiration. And on that note, I will end. Now, I'll answer a few questions, and then before the movie, the video that is in the show that shows these prisons blown into three dimensions is a 12 minute long video, and so we'll play that before we start the movie. But first, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Hi, Dr. Mark here. Thank you so much, and thank you for all you've contributed to this museum. Thank you. I've benefited so much personally, so much. Thank you. Thank you. But I would say, uh, Anne, we will miss you terribly. I'm sure somebody great will come along, but you know, every time somebody does, I miss them. And I, of course, I wish you well. Um, did did, did Piranesi, did he have a social comment? Was there a strong social comment, or he just got onto this kick, so to speak? Well, a social commentary. I mean, I think in the sense, I think, you know, in looking at some of the contemporary buildings, like the Obrogo dei Poveri in Naples, I think there was this, perhaps, a, a kind of salutary warning that, you know, architecture could architecture and the kinds of buildings being built could exceed normal human reason. And there may be some kind of warning about that in the prisons. It's a little bit hard to, well, it's very hard to prove that argument because Piranesi says nothing about, and he doesn't make any direct connection between them. Um, uh, so I, I don't know if you can kind of say he was trying to ad address some ills in society or anything like that. Um, but it is social com in this commentary in the sense that the architecture we live in does condition our lives. And that's for good and for bad. And his attempt to win commissions and design a city of Rome that could replicate the ancient world is grounded in a, in a kind of you know, vaguely utopian philosophy. So you know, inherent in that is a sort of... I just of thought maybe he had a cousin who had been wrongly imprisoned or something, and there were whores and something. No, no, there's nothing, at least not that we know of. You know, Piranesi lived a fairly straight, you know, unlike many artists, he never went to prison so far as we know. He didn't have legal troubles. He didn't have a brother in jail, at least that we, that we know of. Um, I, think it is, it, I think it's a kind of on a broader philosophical, almost utopian um, way that he, if he makes a social commentary, that that, that would apply. Yeah, this is an, this is another question that's come up. Did it wasn't Piranesi influenced by the church at all? Because you know you look at all of these things and there's very little that's religious. Of course, the one building he did build was a church, and he his ambition as an architect, the best commissions would have been church buildings.
There is not, however, a, a kind of deep-seated Catholic culture. So when he designs, when he looks at something like, you know, Santa Maria del Priorato, he fills the church, there's probably an easier way for me to have done this, but he fills the church with Catholic symbolism, um, but it's more like an alternate storehouse of motifs. Um, I'm sure that there are, some of my colleagues would argue with this point, but you know, 18th century Rome was not a time where you wore your religion on your sleeve. It's not a time like the Counter-Reformation where you have a kind of didactic dogmatism of Catholic belief. Um, I think there is the sense that you could build a church that's informed by ancient Roman architecture without that being contrary to the goals of the church. So you don't get a sense of Piranes as a, as a Catholic or not. He just seems to be a, a man of his time in 18th century Rome. But also remember, most, much of his clientele is tourists from England, from Fran well, not so much from, from, from England, from Germany, and they're Protestants. So he can't be too Catholic because that would you know, that creates a certain problem with his clientele. Interestingly, the effect of his prints on architecture is much, much greater in England than it is in Italy. You go to building after building after building all through England that looks inspired by Piranesi's taste, especially in some of the, dec the folios of decorative ornaments, but not so much in Italy. Not as serious as the other questions, but every time I saw those stairs, I knew I had seen them from somewhere and couldn't remember until you put the Harry Potter up? Did, yeah, exactly. I know. I mean, I, look, I, I'm not above a bit of demagoguery, but, uh, you know, everyone, everyone who looks at that print in today's mind frame sees Harry Potter. I mean, sees the movie or remembers the book. I mean, it's, it's so clearly elusive to that particular print that I think, you know, not to put it up there is, is slightly irresponsible in a way. Well, did she know his work or did oh, yeah. somebody else design those you know, for the it, book? It, Piranesi is so pervasive in English culture that, you know, Piranesi kind of equates to taste in English culture. So not only does every country house have a set of Piraneses, but, you know, there's still, okay, I'll be truly demagog demagogic about this and say, you know, Piranesi equates to taste, and so there are facsimiles of Piranesi everywhere. When, for example, you go to the men's room at Mr. A's down the street, this you know, high-minded restaurant, what decorates the men's room are facsimiles of Piranesi prints. They're everywhere. I mean, he, he connotes classical culture. He connotes a kind of learning. And so you know, beyond the prints themselves, the facsimiles and all of that um, persist. So yeah, of course she knew about them. There's no question that she had those prints in mind. Uh, yeah, now anyone's you know, now you're afraid to ask questions because I'm talking about men's rooms and restaurants. But it'd be worse if I talked about the women's room, I guess. Anyway, um, I know you're all here also to see the movie. I, I'm going to ins still insist that Greg show the the 12 minute video that we are also showing in the exhibition, and it's better in the exhibition on the curved screen in the dark, where you can also see the prints on the wall. So as the video goes and moves from room to room, it actually moves from one print to the next. So I'm encouraging people to go to the exhibition, watch the video from the start. It starts in the prison of the title page and moves from prison to prison as it goes forward. It, it, it is in itself a fascinating performance. And that's the term that the creator uses to describe it. It is a performance of Piranese, just as one versus another musician playing the cello suites is a performance. Interestingly, the video that we're about to show first uses Pablo Casal's rendition of the cello suites, and then you're going to watch the movie that has uh, Yo-Yo Ma's. And you'll notice there are, there are, diff there are dis very distinct differences between the two, which is kind of interesting in its own right. So Greg, maybe we could cue the video. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>